to the Bread and Thorns podcast. Hi everyone, welcome to the Bread and Thorns podcast, a bi-weekly podcast where we sit down and discuss literature, art, media, and other stuff we really like and how they influence the projects that we're working on. I'm Isaac. And I'm Rosemary. And today we're going to discuss... Blade, Blade Runner. Runner. Blade Runner is an amazing movie, or I think it's an amazing movie. It is a 1982 science fiction film directed by Ridley Scott and written by Hampton. Fe- I don't know how to pronounce that person's name. Fancher, Ham- Hampton Fancher, Probably and Fancher. David Peoples. I'm going to say Fancher. Fancher. We're really, or I'm really bad at pronouncing names. Maybe <laughs> you should have that job. I'm better at pronouncing names unless they're French. <laughs> All right, let's and find a bunch of French problem. movies. Oh, okay. All right, it's ours Harrison Ford, uh, Rugger Hauer, Sean Young, Edward James Olmos, and it is loosely based on, very, very loosely based, I should say, on Philip K. Dick's uh, very famous novel, uh, Do Android, Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Very loosely. Very, very, very loosely. <laughs> the names and some of the world-building concepts are the same. Right, it's not really... Yeah. At all the same. Yeah. It's it should just more be like inspired by. Yeah. Right? It's inspired by the the novel. Yeah. Um, they contain some of the same concepts such yeah. as or themes like asking questions of what is human, you know, what does it look like when artificial intelligence is where your priorities are. Right. And all those different things. But so it's not based on, it's inspired no. by. It's inspired. According to us. Yes. Rosemary and Isaac. Yes. All right. So the film is set in a dystopian future Los Angeles of 2019 in which synthetic humans known as replicants are bioengineered by the p- powerful Tyrell Corporation to work at space colonies. This is according to Wikipedia. I'm re- just reading off of that first mm-hmm. paragraph there. Hmm. And so when a fugitive group of advanced replicants led by Roy Batty, which, who is Howard, uh, escapes – or who's uh, – portrayed by Howard, I should say, uh, escapes back to Earth, a burnt-out cop named Rick Deckard, who's Harrison Ford, uh, Mm -hmm. reluctantly agrees to hunt them down. Now, that's a pretty pretty okay summary, but I actually... So this film, um, being made in the 1980s, has, like, the, the text in the beginning. It's like... Yeah. It's like almost all sci-fi movies during this era... Yeah, the, the cinematic era. Star Wars had, had it too. Star Wars had it, didn't? Two thousand one, Space I Odyssey. Think Star Wars was what started. Never mind. No. I think it did. Two thousand one. No, 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 Space no. Space Odyssey didn't had it too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that was before. Yeah. Right? And so okay. you, yeah, you have all these sci-fi-ish type films, and they start with these summaries. Yeah. And the summary in this one is really good. I really liked it. I wrote it down. Um, it, this is the beginning part of the of, of the film dun, 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 dun. no i know not i know not even close i know <laughs> that was, I was just going for it 20th century fox First of i'm all, pretty sure 20th century fox <laughs> is my favorite opening uh little music thing followed closely by universal studios oh the the only opening i like is don't say disney Oh, I don't even think of that okay as an good opening. okay cool. um <laughs> it's just a woo doo yeah right? Yeah, I didn't think of that as an opening. Cool. Um, but that is an opening, you're right. Yeah. Um it's the it is twentieth century Fox, but it's a it's a very very specific one. Do you know do you can you do you think you can guess? Because they've changed across the years. I know. Mm, but I, I'm better. I know you there can't was guess a f- this one. I feel like I can, but my brain isn't coming up with it. But I once you say it, I'm gonna be like, Yeah, I know exactly what we're talking about. Because there there are only a couple that they did that are like dramatically different where like uh-huh. I think it wasn't it, it was a different music background wasn't it or was the artwork different i don't remember nope it was the same exact thing except the simpsons oh and you get it's not bart i'm I'm pretty sure it's uh it's the other the other kid lisa no 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 no. it's um the little one the the kid with glasses mill mill mildred yeah mildred right it's mildred i'm pretty sure he he, at the beginning he goes oh god (laughs) <laughs> like it's <laughs> oh it's the best it's the best okay that intro. is not what I was thinking of. there's another one that does something similar but that one is a good one that I one is fun I can't do my voice like that again alright that's I'm, beautiful I'm sorry everybody who's listening that <gasps> what? was what I horrendous. did the drag voice a few times you can only do Mildred once fine yeah I can't I can't do that to my voice fine uh, that's, that's not apparently I care more about this I'm <laughs> just kidding um, no I just care about my vocal cords a little uh... bit more <laughs> alright so anyways yeah. this this film kind of opens with I love this film 
Um, oh, yeah, sorry. This is my film, obviously. Yeah. It is not Rosemary's film. It is not. Rosemary hates this film I for some do. reason. She... It's not an intense hatred. It's more like... It's pretty intense hatred. I can't... It's okay. It mirrors... It's not the same, but it kind of it, it, it kind of parallels how I feel about the room. Like, why did Whoa. you make me watch this? Whoa. And I don't want to have to watch it again. I almost want to stop this podcast right now. <laughs> did you just put Blade Runner and The Room yeah. in the same... Yeah. Again, right. the room is way, 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 way worse. The Blade Runner, like I can at least like analyze and have fun with Blade Runner. Like it, I'm, I'm willing to look at the themes and I'm willing to look at what's there because there is more depth. The room doesn't have any more depth. Blade Runner has the depth. The room, the room has a lot of There's depth. No what depth. are you talking about? There's no depth. I don't... Blade Runner has more <laughs> more depth. And one of the other things is, um, and I'll to all of our listeners who who are who are uh, or I guess listening. Mm. Uh, please correct Rosemary about uh, the room and show her in the comments uh, how much. Depth I like this. There I, is. I'm I'm okay with the second half of Blade Runner. Of the, of the room. I'm okay with the second half of Blade Runner. How are you okay with the second half but not the first? Anyways, all right. So, <laughs> we'll get there. so this is clearly not on my list. So Isaac, it where is, is it at list. on your list? This is number eight on my list. So after the Matrix and then Arrival and then it's this one. Mm -hmm. See, I think that both the Matrix and Arrival should be before Blade Runner, but that's just my personal opinion. I, I also can think see it why. Should, I can understand why it's on your top ten. I would never have it anywhere near my top ten, but I do see why you would have it there. I could see I it as your number eleven, given that it. Palm Springs is number ten. Hmm? <laughs> I said I can see it as your number eleven, given no. that Palm Springs is number ten. No, no, no. Honestly, as I was watching this, I was like, "This is my, this is your version of Palm Springs," for me. No, I think. And this you is, have it higher than number ten. This would be. I think this is similar no. to Princess Bride no. for for you because not not because because that's I mean kind of at least as far as the movies we've watched so far. Palm Springs. Actually, you didn't find anything to like about Palm Springs, but right. you did find a couple things. Okay, That's what fine. I'm saying. In terms of my liking it, it's like Princess Bride. Right. In terms of my lack of understanding why you have it in like the top ten, like it's 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 Palm Springs. Well, I don't okay, know why you so have Princess Bride. So if none Bride of you have yours. watched this, if, so, if you guys haven't watched this movie before, like I would recommend watching it once, simply because. Um, Somewhat similar to Isaac's opinion of the room, it's good to watch when um, you haven't seen it just for cultural appreciation. So you understand mm -hmm. like where a bunch of because this was done in uh, 1989, right? And so 85, the, 85, 85, 82, 82. Sorry. Wow, Phew. okay, 1982. And so it's something where this kind of directed where the future headed a little bit. We're we're still working on a lot of things that are in here. Um, same with Star Wars. Same with uh, 2001: Space Odyssey. Like these are movies that. Uh, help guide what people think of when they think of futuristic movies and thinking of the future. Um, you can actually see hints of it in our political structure. It's not even just in a in an aesthetic way. So definitely, I would recommend watching this movie. Just know that it doesn't get. I don't consider it to be a good movie until like the really awkward makeout scene that I am surprisingly fond of. <laughs> That that is the turning point in the movie that for me. That is so strange. It's very strange. That is it's usually, strange for me. That's usually the scene that people get really turned off by. It took me a second, but I've also there's this book that I've been reading that's uh, the way they talk about like openness and uh, masculine feminine roles. It's really interesting. Maybe when we get to that, we can. And get so to anyway, talk about point it. is that it was a very interesting scene because I could absolutely because the first time I watched it, I was like. What like, like I, I was not happy when it, when that happened. And so this time, this is only the second time I've watched it, and I was like, oh, oh, okay. And so there were a couple things that shifted. But anyway, so, so this my is Isaac's number My recommendation seven. would be for you to watch it a third time and then Maybe. see that increase even more. This Maybe. is one of these movies where, the mo for the most part, uh, not me, but a <laughs> lot of people, when they first watched it, they actually had the same reaction that you did. Fun. And the second time they watched it, they have the same reaction you do now. And then as That's they irritating. watch it subsequently, uh, it Maybe. gets really, really good. Because, I mean, um, I was going to say this a little bit earlier when I was planning um, this, this podcast today or this episode today. Woo. But this is actually, this is the only movie in my entire list that I am really scared of talking about. Really? Yes. Um, huh. 
and it's because this movie has such a pedigree in terms of film and in terms of just everything that I love. Did about Alien come before or after this? Before. It was, okay, so yeah. Ridley Scott Alien did Alien was first. Seventy. Oh, I want to say seventy nine. Okay. And then. Uh, okay. And then Blade Runner. I just couldn't remember if it was before or after. I'm like, I know Ridley Scott did Alien. Is That's what I know Ridley Scott for. Man, I have to go back and look, but Alien was first. Okay. Yeah. Alien is a gorgeous film. It is a beautiful film. Yeah. I'm very, very, very impressed with that. Um, I sometimes wonder and think, like, should I have Alien a little bit no. higher on my... Maybe. Uh, on my list, but I haven't, I haven't even... <laughs> I mean, this is just top ten. The point that we're is, now. this movie has a pedigree. Yeah. And I'm really scared of talking about it because Aww. I feel like everything that I can think of um, has been analyzed to the nth degree, and I'm only kind of scratching the surface uh, for this for this film. And so, anyone who's looking for a super deep uh, original take on Blade Runner, you're not going to hear it from me. <laughs> but, um, but I do love this film, and I, the very first time I watched it, I didn't love it as I as much as I do now. Okay, but I knew this is going to be one of my favorite movies ever, um, just because. I, the immediate the boom of the soundtrack when you when you first enter the the beginning credits scene yeah. it's not even the beginning scene where LA lights up but in that first drum roll part and the and you hear that lone synth uh, happen yeah. or uh, hear that lone synth play um, with the the, the it was title very eerie, sequence but yeah. it's so good um, again I, I mean impressed. when you I don't know how you watched it but when you watch it with a full sound system. It's very difficult to not. He's suddenly mocking be me for boom. being broke uh, now. <laughs> oh, I'm not. I'm not mocking you. I mean, if you have Wait, a good. If you watch it with a full set, no, you're not. You're not. Sorry. <laughs> if you watch, I mean, if you watch it with a really good set of headphones as well, right? And you that hear that bass, and it's just kind of rum- well. It, it's a little bit more, a little bit less, but like if when you, when you have full speaker sets, it it's rumbles all the room. About that bass. Right. It's all about that bass, right? <laughs> anyway, yeah. So so and it rumbles the room, and immediately you're like, oh my gosh, this is, I'm like being taken into this experience, and it's just the opening credit sequence yeah right um which is very ridley scott uh, i think and then after that you get into the summary of the the setup of the film right and it's this is the text that, that that's written there that I, that I copied down early in the 21st century the tyrell corporation advanced robot evolution into the nexus phase a being virtually identical to a human known as a replicant the Nexus Six replicants were superior in strength and agility and at least equal in intelligence to the genetic engineers who created them. Replicants were used off-world as slave labor in the hazardous exploitation and colonization of other planets. After a bloody mutiny, a Nexus Six combat team in an off-led colony, replicants uh, were declared illegal on Earth under penalty of death. Special police squads called Blade Runner units had orders to shoot to kill upon detection any trespassing replicant. This was not called execution. This was called retirement. I Ooh. love that beginning explanation. I feel like that's what inspired so many, like, because I think the next 20 years or so, yep. they started switching it into, not like, when you have, years, like, like agents. Now. Well, uh, no, but it got really, now it's just kind of taken for granted. Right. But it started being this thing of, like, like, um, like FBI agents aren't, aren't uh, executed, they're retired. Right. Or, and, and there, well, and there are people who, like, who work for the CIA that, like, managed to get out alive. Like, mm-hmm. they, they knew all of these secrets, they were higher up, and they right. managed to, like, leave at the right time in the right way so they mm-hmm. can live off the grid and yeah. not die. That um, whole entire concept. Yeah, partially is, is by yeah. Blade Runner, and it's it's just such an amazing setup. Mm-hmm. It just by I mean, films are supposed to be visual, and so when you get text, it's almost it's very difficult to get text right. I yes. think in a film because I think no they had the retirement in red, right? I don't remember. I think they had the retirement. In oh, red. okay. Oh, I should clarify. random fun fact with visual. I should clarify. Uh, we are not. There are seven versions of this film. And we, uh, I am not going to go through every Seven. single change uh, that happened from the original uh, premiere cut to, the, or the original audience cut to the final cut that oh we my have goodness today gracious. in 2007. Um, I am only talking about the final cut. I've seen, I've seen the original theatrical. I've seen the directors, and I've seen. I think that there was like a DVD version, and then and, and I've seen the, the the final cut as well. My recommendation for anyone who hasn't seen Blade Runner, go watch the final cut. Um, if you get confused... Does it have wa- the most? 
Uh, no, there's actually a, a a small scene in the director's cut that was taken out, small, tiny little bit um, that was taken out in the final mm. cut. And so, uh, I, th- I think, oh man, I, I have to go, I, again, okay. I'm not, I'm not gonna Got go it. through all the changes because there are a lot of changes. Uh, R- Ridley Scott basically filmed this uh, masterpiece, I would say, <laughs> <laughs> this masterpiece, showed it to an audience who did not get it at all. This wasn't the the, the the theater audience. This is like a pre, I forgot what it's called, but it's like a pre-showing. Pre-screening. Yeah, pre-screening to kind yeah. of get the audience to, to see if the audience responds and how they respond. He showed it to them. They did not like it. And what the studio did was they forced him to make Harrison Ford do a narration. I hated that. And that was the version, I believe, that was shown in theaters. I genuinely, like the end of the movie with the narration, yeah. I hate that so much. He, yeah. do, he sounds... He sounds bored. Bored? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He sounds bored, yeah. and I'm like... Harrison Ford was actually against it. Ridley Scott was against it. Everybody was against it except the studio execs. But they wanted him to do it because they thought the film was too confusing for, for general audiences. And so they did that. Uh, the film kind of bombed in theaters anyways. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, in subsequent years... But there was a cult following because kind yes. of, there were people that kind of got the vision yeah. of, of the film... And then in subsequent years, Ridley Scott made these changes until I believe the last one was the, the final cut was in two thousand seven. That which gives is very me a recent. little bit of hope. I feel like they don't do that very much anymore. But um, well, George Lucas did it with Star Wars and uh, yeah, you know that was the last first. one was in the nineties, right? <laughs> no, um, I thought the last edit the last for edits Return were, of the Jedi was in the nineties. The last edits were in the two thousands, I believe, in the special yeah. DVD versions. Okay, um, when the prequels were being released. I okay. Think. I actually have a, um, or I've seen the, there were these people that kind of took the original theatrical, I think, no, no, the original theatrical versions, I think, of the film. Okay. Somehow got the, the things, and they, 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 they upped the resolution to 4K, yeah. and then kind of recolored it to make, make it look more like the, the, the original version that was released. It's uh, for Star Wars. Star Wars New mm. Hope, uh, Star Wars Empire Strikes Back. And uh, the Return, Return of the Jedi. Jedi. I haven't seen the Return of the Jedi one, but the Empire Strikes Back one is gorgeous. It's yeah. So when you see film like this again, like it's just because it's not digital. You know, it's it's very it's not clear and crisp, yeah. but it's there's kind of an organic quality to the film yeah. and everything. And when you enhance that in in 4K, it's it's very easy to spec and be amazed <laughs> by by it. And so. His eyes just got really wide, and was yeah, just, it was just like this little adoring, like. <sighs> little I do side really like it. old film. Uh, I, I like me old, too. Well, not old old hey, film. Hey, I prefer VHS. Okay, I genuinely would rather have a VHS it's over a DVD. It's hard to watch VHS in in full or Blu-ray, full kind of quality these days, though, because you don't have it two TVs anymore. It seems stretched yeah. usually when you do that. Yeah. If you have a VHS, because most TVs aren't designed to right. accommodate that. But if you get a C, like kind of a CRT. TV system, like a tube TV system that's huge, and you put the VHS in, it's just, it's absolutely gorgeous. I kind of so, like that. Anyway, yeah, I was looking is, up that for video games yeah. a while ago, and apparently it works for video games yeah. as well. Wait, okay, so why oh, yeah, sorry. do you like the final <laughs> cut? Why do you like this version, and why do you like this version of this movie so much? Well, first, the final cut is, uh, it's I think it's Blu-ray quality. Um, like, it's not, not just, it's, it's obviously released on Blu-ray, but it's not just stretched to Blu-ray, if that makes sense, right? It's okay. It's kind of restored into the Blu-ray. Okay. And they did. They. I'm not. Sh- I. I'm not because sh- I watched the director's cut a while ago, um, and the final cut's the only one I have, and so I'm not sure if they did it between the director's cut and the final cut. But there is a a certain recoloring that they did with the shots that make certain things really, really stand out. I think as they should. And so um, I really love, for example, the Blade Runner gun, the, the design yes. of that gun. The handgun, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, no, the that was really that cool. Harrison Ford has, right? And in the final cut, it just looks really menacing. Yeah. In the first shot. And then as the film progresses, it becomes less and less menacing. It's just, it's really interesting to, 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 to see how, how, how that happened. And that, till mm. the end, it just looks like a normal handgun. Yeah. And it, it's, it looks very useless. Uh, in, in, in Harrison's Ford's hand, which, which which is what it's supposed to be kind of like, right? Because you get this degeneration of this cop character into 
what he is in the end, right? Um, and so I, I think so. And, but the 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 way that they shot it, and then the way that it's been colored and 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 kind of composited in the final cut. The the gun is just one example. Everything else is is also right. Um, it just to me it stands out so much as a film, mm-hmm. and it's what I enjoy and in a, in a sense what I remember of the film when I first watched it. Right. Okay. I'm not sure if I watched the film as a final cut first. I just know I I watched it. It didn't have the narration. I know that. Um, oh, then it probably wasn't the final cut. It wasn't. Well, no, no. The final cut doesn't have the narration. Oh, which one did? Oh, now I'm curious which one I watched. Okay, all right. Yeah. So wait, did you watch the one with the narration? I watched the one with the narration. Yeah. It was really irritating, it's and I really did not bad. remember the narration, and I was like, "Why does he sound like this?" Like, yeah. <sighs> yeah. So the the only time I've watched the narration was actually on a plane, um, and on I guess on the plane they they only have certain versions of films, and the cleanest one is the one with the narration in a sense huh. um and so that's I, okay. I watched it and i was like oh i'm so glad i i didn't watch this version first okay. <laughs> because i might have hated this movie just because of the narration it's really it's so annoying bad. yeah well and it's one of those things okay so okay so i will uh, okay i will get into the parts that i do like Mm -hmm. but the one thing that like and now i'm I'm coming to accept it but it's still there's still residue of hatred on this sure this is the only movie where harrison ford isn't harrison ford that i can think of yes so i am both impressed by that he is very not harrison ford very frustrating he's not the president of the united states he's not a scoundrel yeah of like or he's honestly or just like this weak broken down yep. alcoholic man and yep. it's this weird weird thing it's amazing especially like me like i've grown up with like harrison ford as indiana jones mm-hmm. he's a he's a hero he's this like scoundrelly guy who like right. there's there's some warmth and some humor and even if he is depressed or uh-huh. there is alcoholism like all right fine uh-huh. but um but you've never seen harrison ford broken. so broken yeah. And so I am impressed with the acting in this. The mm-hmm. problem is that he honestly like and then the narration kind of like nailed so, it in there of just so, like right. he looks like he hates doing this. No, he did not hate doing the film. He hated doing the narr- narration. Okay. Because both him and Ridley Scott were very very against the idea of and, and so you can I mean I think you, you can, can hear tell. it in his voice. You he can just, hear it in his yeah. voice. He's like yeah, so this <laughs> happened, and then right. this happened, but thankfully, I get to go off with this girl. Who so, knows how long we're gonna live? Cause nobody knows how long anyone's going to live. Like that, it's it's, it's, it's the most <laughs> dull, boring. Like, and it, I'm that just like, I feel, of it. I feel for Harrison Ford. <laughs> right. Like reading this, cause like he could have, he could have done an amazing job with that. I he don't could've. think he wanted to. He didn't want to. No, 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 you can hear it in his voice. He did not want to. He would. Yeah. I feel like he just did like one cut, and he's like, I'm not doing anything else. And they're yeah. like, fine, we'll have to use it. And he's like, what? But it sucks. And he's like, well, you won't do anything else. Right. So. Yeah, so. But yeah, but it is brilliant because Harrison Ford isn't Harrison Ford. He's not the Harrison Ford. Yep. Um, uh, he's actually a character, mm-hmm. uh, which he, is interesting. Yeah, he is definitely, it, he's very outside of his quote-unquote typecast. Yeah. Um, but he does it really wonderfully, I yeah. think, that he, I didn't, I mean, I'm not that enamored with Harrison Ford. There is actually one where he's a scientist that I can't think for the life of me what the name of it is, but there is one where he has, like, glasses and he's a scientist, and I do not remember, but um, he does not play himself in that one as well, and I liked that one way more. I just cannot remember what it is. So I would recommend that you go back and watch this a third time without mm. the narration. Go watch the final go cut. Go find one without the narration. Um, no, no, not, just watch the final cut. Because that's the one I'm going to be talking about. The final cut does away with the ending of the one that you're talking about. So that little nice mountain. They pretty much thing. just stop it at the end of the elevator, right? Yes. Yeah. So he, so he sees the origami. Yeah, unicorn, unicorn. goes into the elevator unicorn. and it ends. And Pretty it's real. a great ending. It's a yeah. very, very Okay, that's good the, fir- the first time that I watched it, because I actually own it. I bought okay. it because you recommended it so highly. And uh-huh. so I was like, oh my gosh, I'm probably going to like this movie. And then I watched it, and I was like, Isaac, I am so disappointed right now. <laughs> I have been let down. <laughs> and so I own it. I just I was watching with a friend, and so I, I needed it on um, uh, some kind of internet access. And so I just rented it on Prime. And Prime apparently has they the only really have dumb the, one. Yeah, they only they have I the dumb one. Um, and so uh, because I remember, so. I remembered it only. I was like, wait, there there are things here that like weren't right. here before. Yep. 
Um, there are things that are etched out or th that are scratched yeah. out too. So the unicorn dream sequence isn't in there. Yeah, no, but it's in the one with the narration. No, 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 no. It's it's not in the one. Oh, you must have watched. Okay, all right. So now <laughs> we're going. Now we're going into another one. All right. So apparently there's seven versions. Yeah, there's seven versions of this. So it's very difficult to, to to know which one you watched. Um, but yeah, mine had the unicorn dream and um the uh the uh, oh gosh Beatty uh Roy Beatty Roy Bracket Roy Batty. No, Rutger Hauer. Oh, Roy yeah. Batty. Rutger's yeah, the name. Duh. Yeah. yeah. Hauer's so, the actor. Roy, Roy Batty. Um, uh, like, like putting uh, Pris's blood on his face. Uh -huh. That was, I don't think, I don't remember that from the other one. That part. So I that was is like, in the final cut. That is in the final cut? Yep. Okay, I don't remember that. Anyway. Yeah. That was but, a good um, scene. It was an interesting scene. I did appreciate, like, again, I appreciate the last third of the movie. I think you way watched more the one the right before the, the director's cut. Probably. I think. Anyway, but, um,. Yeah, but no, but I had the unicorn dream sequence and I had the narration with the car driving scene at the end and I was a little weirded out because I was like, okay, maybe I just forgot about this because I didn't like the movie. Nope. So it's good to know. That scene is not supposed to be in there. Okay, wait, a... so why do you like this? I'm assuming, cause, oh. uh, and as far as I know of you, I would assume that most of it has to do with like the world building and then the themes because you're a very thematic person. Because I'm a dramatic person, you're a thematic person. Anyway, um, that wasn't as funny uh, as I wanted. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, so it was something where with um, yeah, you're right. It is to do with themes. Uh, it's the the first the biggest reason I would say is that it is the world building. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's something about this world that Dark, I want grungy, to desolation. keep going back. It's not just that. Um, but it's the saturation of a single vision everywhere, right? And so there, you have this guy who's envisioning in 1980s, the 1980s, mm -hmm. what 2019 would look like in Los Angeles. Yeah. Right? He's trying to project into the future. He's not that far off. And It's pretty the, dark, dirty, so, and disgusting. Yeah, it's dark, dirty, and disgusting, but everything is except for the higher up, Corporate. Corporation? Yeah, okay. right? And it's this kind of very... I think that part of the film, you can see it, um, how it has influenced Hollywood uh, since, yes. right? That you have this hierarchy of uh, Well, you can the see influences of this in Big Hero 6. Yeah, so, so like, you can see that... Influences a lot. Right, this, this movie influences almost everything since. Mm-hmm. Despite not being, despite being a box office bomb, mm -hmm. right? This movie has such a, um, such an influence on all of cinema, but so that's actually that is actually one of the reasons why it's in my top ten. I think okay. for a movie to to have that again that pedigree of influence in all he of likes film, blue blooded movies. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. No, because royalty, blue blood, that's that's, a, that's totally a thing. Oh, okay. Blue blooded versus blue collar is not royalty, but blue blood is. Well, usually... my blood is red, so. Yes, but it's the theme. <laughs> Actually, technically, it doesn't go red <laughs> until it hits oxygen, and then anyway. So, um, <laughs> so what we have is that 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 influence, right? And it's really it's fascinating for me to see where all the influence comes from as you go into in, into the film, but it permeates everything that, that happens. And so from the very opening sequence where LA is lit up and you see both the, the light, the, the kind of a city of lights feel, but yet also despite being the city of lights and industry, also being a city covered in darkness, right? Mm -hmm. That contrast, right? Um, and it just, I, I don't know, every time I see that, I, I, I get enveloped into it. Whenever I see those pyramids, I, I, I want to not be in there <laughs> because it's so dirty. <laughs> but I, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I feel like I'm the fly on the wall in a fascinating world I don't understand. I feel like, for me personally, it's like, okay, so... With Blade Runner, you have this dirty, gross, disgusting LA, which is still pretty accurate, and um, uh, all it's these different the things that they got right and the cultural that they got influences. Wrong. It's really yeah. interesting. Yes, yeah. and um, uh, and so it's something where like the way that they did it, where it's this dark, grungy, like everything sucks and criminals and stuff and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, it, the, I'd rather watch um, Dark Knight. 
Okay. The way they do Gotham in, in, in those three movies, mm-hmm. usually actually the first two. The third one's not that dark, actually. They have much there's there's more white in that well, one. Well, the trilogy of the Dark Knight is progressively brighter. Yeah, and so it's something where with the first two, like I'd rather have that kind of dark city, um, rather than this one. Personally. Ooh, dark City's a good movie too. Uh you haven't seen it. I have not. But um <laughs> But no, it's something where, and the, honestly, the things that I liked about this one were the very accurate, like, the gentle, oppressive guidance home in certain things where it's like, okay, move along. Like, you have no reason to be here. Move, like, like and you can hear it's, like, electronic, I think. It sounded electronic. It sounded robotic. Um, yeah. But, I like, mean, the curfew things and whatnot, and I was just like, this is scarily familiar. Right. And yeah. it would be more likely to happen that way because you can pretend that a voice that sounds like that is there for your benefit, that's there mm-hmm. for the greater good, um, even though it's oppressing you. Yeah, so. so this film is the beginnings, I believe, of cyberpunk. Um, there is no movie before this that, okay. that was cyber, or really really even like any kind of fiction that was cyberpunk. This really started that, that cyberpunk okay. feel. And from corporate advertisements on buildings, yeah, right, to the grungy streets, to the higher technology that you have, all, flying cars, all this mm-hmm. kind of stuff, and then of course the corporate pyramid structure uh, that enforces hierarchy and authority onto the populace. That entire idea comes from Blade Runner. Okay, so I have a question. Mm-hmm. You mentioned things they got right and things they got wrong. What do you think they got wrong? Because the only one that I can think of is like the flying cars. Right, so flying cars, we don't have Japanese billboards on the face of buildings. Uh, we don't have pyramid structures that are so overt in their oppressiveness. <laughs> we don't Oh, is have that the language? Is, is that the language? Is it more Japanese? Okay, so Because I, I don't know my So it's dialects. Par- Oh, it's partially Japanese, but uh-huh. it's also, it's kind of its own... Thing. Thing, okay. yeah. It's not wholly Japanese. Okay. Yeah. And so what you have is this kind of... I mean, they envision correctly a mishmash of cultures, Mm -hmm. right? They envision correctly the dirtiness of urban living in, Mm -hmm. in, you know, present day. Yep. Today. If you go walk down L.A., you will need a shower afterwards. (laughs) Yeah. And then, (laughs) but so they envision, they they envision certain things very well, but because of the limits in technology, uh, they didn't understand what was going to happen. So they didn't understand that, the, the graphical user interface would become more powerful than the voice-activated interface. Right? That was interesting. And so it's... Oh, and the seven-digit phone number. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, so you have these interesting... like It's very, again, it's interesting the, way, the things that they did get right, which are thematically all, all those things they did get right, right? And then, but then the actual technology that this was this film was admired for and copied off of. So things like um, Ghost in the Shell, things like The mm-hmm. Matrix, things like Akira, things like all these different, different. Um, actually, did Akira? No, no, I don't think Akira came before. I'm pretty sure it came after. Um, but all these different movies and films and, and things that followed after this, they, they, they copied, in a sense, the technology of the world mm-hmm. building. But that's what they got wrong in, in a very weird way, right? Well, that makes sense. Yes, yeah, yeah. That makes sense why people would use that because it's not real. So it's still in the realm of uh, well, it was the, the imaginal the, the world. future, right? This yeah, is what but the parts that they like. got wrong are the parts that would still be used because it's it's still like, well, you can still pretend like 100 years from now that's going to happen. Well, we don't. So, so thematically they got it right. So we don't have, you know, big moving billboards on buildings. We have phones that we, we you know, voluntarily We're look at and usually addicted yeah, to addicted to right we don't have uh, a we don't have a voice acti- activated interface we have a graphical uh, user interface that we actually we we are starting to use the voice as well right mm-hmm. with i think like Siri and Alexa and things like that mm-hmm. uh, we don't have the physical pyramid structure but right now it's very difficult to to argue that corporatism doesn't exist Right, where yep. the corporations have more power than even the political, uh, you know, elites and everything yeah. like that. It's very difficult to argue that that hasn't happened. Um, we don't have flying cars, but we do have very dirty streets and <laughs> and, and and a lot of crime in a lot of these. Well, urban we have a lot areas. of impressive cars. So the cars oh, yeah. that they right. used are similar, just mm-hmm. with ours don't fly. Right, and so so it's it's it, again. Like, but we do actually have flying cars; they're just not popular because of how they work. 
Well, we don't have. Well, you're right because flying cars, the way that it's imagined in Blade Runner,、uh, wouldn't really work in real life, at least as far as we can do now. Yeah. But we can do something. We you do have you know passenger drones, right? Where、mm-hmm. you can fly from one area to another. They aren't technically legal, like in terms of like official legal、mm-hmm. transportation、um, uh, vehicles. But th- we do have them, right? And so there. And what I like about p- another reason I like this film is it everything feels so grand yet extremely claustrophobic, right? Yeah, and so you like have the these... Bradbury, the hotel that yeah.、Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. JF Sebastian is in. Yeah, like I would absolutely love to explore that. I would never in a million years want to live there、nope. in that state, but I would absolutely want to explore that because、yeah. the, some it's beautiful. Yeah, it's the setup and everything. It just looks just... like a horrific place to live. Yeah, yeah, and so you would. It's it's again, it's that haunted house kind of thing、mm-hmm. where you know it's old, you know it's broken down. There might there might be a story there that you really want to explore and find out. But about, you want to be able to go home you, afterwards. Right, you want to go back to your fields,、yeah. <laughs> clean fields and backyards and stuff,、yeah. homes afterwards, right? And so it's it's so just everything kind of in this film just grabs me,、okay. um, and won't let go in a sense. And I love that the、How、film. How do you feel about? Oh, sorry. You love that the film isn't. I love that the film isn't a even though you do have action. There's nothing in the action that is what we would call modern day, like an action film. the The action is very violent, and it's it it's not celebrated. Yes. Right. And I love that about this film. Okay. Because, because I did appreciate that. It's unsettling. Yeah, everything like it's, yeah, when, it's when not appreciated. When he first kills that replicant, it's the most tragic. Thing. Oh my god! I hate that bra so much.、Right. I hate it so much. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I just.、Uh, I mean, it, it's, that it's, is a solid like like that is a solid third of the reason. That outfit is a third of the reason why. Because I liked the boots. I wasn't against the boots. I that was a third of the reason why I was against. But it's not meant to be comfortable. The movie. It's not meant to be comfortable. I don't、it's, care if it's meant to be comfortable. Her running like that, it would have fallen off. I don't care how grippy her shoulder things were. It's meant to be uncomfortable. It、and、was. Exactly, they succeeded. Yeah, they succeeded. <laughs> I was uncomfortable. <laughs> and and so and I don't want to watch it again. <laughs> it's meant to be like this. Next time, I'll just skip to the kissing. It it's meant to be this extremely inhumane thing. Yes. Right. And that's that's the that's the world that this 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 film inhabits. You were gonna ask something.、Uh, so, how do you feel about creepy toys? Because that、oh, yeah. is genuinely that was another part of like unsettling, which、yeah. like it made sense why he was creating、mm-hmm. them. It makes sense、yeah. why he liked them so much, but、yeah. it was just yeah. It's meant to be that way. It's meant to be. It's the uncanny valley, right? There, there's there's a a term called the uncanny valley,、mm. right? Where it's almost human, but not quite. But、yes. You can't really. Or it's either too perfect or just a little too wrong. Right. So you, but you can't. You don't know what it is. Yeah. You can't pick out what it exactly is that makes it so uncanny, right? But it's that uncanny valley makes it horror when you're watching, right? But it's not horror like today where it's you know jump scares and you know I guess demons and all this kind of stuff. It's human. It's uncannily human. And you can't look away, and yet you detest it at the same time. One of the brilliant things with this movie that I did genuinely really appreciate, like both times I watched it, but I appreciated it more this time, is the replicants are children、yep. in adult bodies. Yep. And so、Four、how they、old. handle emotions, how they handle、uh-huh. social interactions, it was just this really interesting thing of like, whoa, that's how a three or four year old would react、yep. to death. That's how a three or four year old would react to love or sadness or. Um, uh, pain,、mm-hmm. uh, and they would have an emotional response to all of those things. Yeah. So when Howard, really or sorry, Roy Batty,、right? yeah, when, he, when he's reacting to death, yeah, around him, it's just the most. It's again, it crosses the valleys so much, well, and the protectiveness with Pris, because、mm-hmm. it's something where like if you have like a four year old, like slightly older brother or whatever, and he's and he and he has this moment of doubt of like oh my gosh like it's just us we're we're alone and he kind of starts to break and she's like oh my gosh we're never gonna make it we're stupid and we're gonna die also just like. You can imagine every four-year-old like our parents have left us. We're going to die. Like even just、right. at the grocery store, it doesn't even have to be anything big. And that 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 like that that bigger than life 
thinking. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just so, and then he, and then he jumps in and is like, no, like we're gonna be fine. And I'm mm-hmm. like, you can totally picture like an older sibling telling that to the younger sibling yep. of just, just like, hey, like it's gonna be okay. And it's, it's like, like, I'm gonna take care of, even though it's not like, you it's know, it's really, not. It's really, really not. And um, it was just, it was just really interesting to watch. I mean, and these are children in in, in human emotion, adult bodies. But they're, the, you know, the Roy Batty is a soldier. Yeah. Right? He's uh, Pris is a sex slave, right? Uh, Leon is a worker, construction yeah. worker. And I well, they were all the put on was. a combat team together, weren't they? That was I wasn't sure, but that was kind of how they made it. I seem I think like. that part is ambiguous. Um, you could interpret it that way, or you they were all together, or they all met. Later. Right, you could interpret it as I mean they don't, they don't give that that part of the yeah, the, and then the, the snake lady. Um, but you know they met somehow, right? Yeah. So, but you don't know how, right? Yeah. You don't know if they were part of a humans human squad yeah. of, of soldiers or whatever. And Pris was the the pleasure model that was being used by the. Well, it's also you can use that to seduce and infiltrate. Right. Sure. So yeah, yeah. it would still fit. So it's all of these different things. It but just depends how much they followed the book or not. Because if they did it as they all were well, a team, I know, I know. <laughs> that's why I'm like, it depends if they took that as part of what it in, was inspired with. Is the idea that they were a combat team or not? So there's not much. No, <laughs> there really isn't. Um, but so, right. So you, you, you're kind of Blade. That's why this movie is or film is called Blade Runner, not do Android Nexus. dream of oh, electric sure. sheep. Right. There, there's yeah. it's it's inspired by. That's it's actually there are things inspired by. It's uh, not TV shows very... inspired by this too, like yes. Electric Dreams and whatnot. Um, that was, as far as I'm aware, very, 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 very closely related to um, this. I, I don't know. So I don't, they, they came, because it's, it's, it's kind of like the Twilight Zone and Black Mirror where mm-hmm. you have like these just unsettling things. I think yeah. Black Mirror is always trying to like teach you something or show you some weird dark side of humanity. Electric Games is a little bit more like, wouldn't it be effed up if this happened? Which Twilight Zone is very much like, wouldn't it be effed up if this happened? Like sometimes they do morals, but it, it's also a little bit well, more Black like, Mirror is more kind of p- putting our current circumstances in the future. Yeah. Right. But the the idea of Black Mirror is that those things are actually happening now. Mm-hmm. We just don't recognize it because mm-hmm. we're sitting in the situation. But let's take that and extrapolate it into into a world with futuristic technology, mm-hmm. and then you can see what's wrong with it. But then when you rec- if you, when you recognize that gap, then you go, oh, okay, this is actually happening now, now. right? And that's the that's the depression of Black Mirror, yes. I think. Uh, rather than Blade Runner is still a little bit more fantastical. It's a little bit more far removed. Um, it's more exploratory of kind of forms and ideas rather than explaining the now. Yeah. That makes I sense. guess one also the first time that I watched it, I was actually somewhat convinced that Harrison Ford's character was a replicant. Yeah. Okay. I genuinely, that was my first impression was that that was one of the reasons why he was struggling is because he had taken the test himself and he hadn't passed. And he was like, he didn't know if he was killing human beings or not, or if mm-hmm. he was, or if um, he was actually a replicant. I mean, that's one of the beautiful things about this film. It mm-hmm. makes you think it makes you go it. And if you're a writer and you like to build worlds, it makes you think in those terms. Like, did he really take the test? Did he take the test? Like, did he? Mm-hmm. Does he know if he's a replicant or not? Just what would that do to you? Well, it's also with replication. How much is it like cloning? Because one of the things with cloning is you can reproduce the body, but you can't create spirit. You can't create a soul. And so it's something where, um, with that. But what there does is that a even difference, mean, and so exactly, and so it's something where thankfully I haven't had to deal with that yet. I really don't want to have to do the research necessary when that happens. It's gonna happen, and I really don't want it to. But um, when human cloning becomes popular, there's going to be this kind of existential question. You think question. human cloning hasn't happened? <laughs> no, I think it has, oh, but cloning. it's not popular. <laughs> How do you know I'm not a clone? You're too irritating. <laughs> no, a that's clone not true. of me Clones wouldn't be irritating? That's interesting. I feel like a clone <laughs> would be really terrified of everyone finding out that they are a clone because they'd be ostracized. Or would they? Probably. Maybe you're the only human left. Please don't do that to me. <laughs> can, we not, can we not pull a beautiful mind again? I'd really appreciate it. No, the world does not revolve around me. Thank God. I'm so you're happy right. about that, which means that I cannot be the only human left. Or it doesn't revolve around you because you're the only human left. I would hate that so much. Anyway, themes. What other themes do you like about this, Isaac? 
So we actually haven't even gotten into the plot yet. Um, oh, yeah. But the, well, the plot the of plot. the film is very, very simple, right? Um, and so there's actually not much to go into. And I think a lot of the a lot of the films I do have on my list, they do have very simple plots. Well, yeah, because then you can dive deep into themes, which is right. your favorite thing. Yeah, and so this one is just a guy who has to hunt these four replicants down. Mm -hmm. And in the process, he finds out a woman who he, he's attracted to is also a replicant. And this opens all sorts of cans of worms in mm -hmm. terms of how you think of things, right? Yeah. Especially course, because she thinks that she's human. 100%. Yeah. Like, these other beings, they were raised knowing that they were replicants. Sure. They knew that they had something um, different. So the question becomes, what does it do to somebody if if everything... It, on, on the surface level, it's what does it do to somebody when they find out that who they thought they were is not at all true? Yeah. But on a deeper level, then you go into the question that we were about to go into, which is, what is a soul? Because if you're in that state... And you're thinking, I'm not human, but every I thought I had this quality about me that was very uh, that only humans have, and then suddenly that's taken away from you. What is that like? What what is it? Then what does it mean to to be and to exist, right? And that's I think a very when you bring up the idea that Deckard might be a replicant, right? I'm not going to go on. I'm not going to reveal which side I'm, I'm on on that. Oh, um, f fine then. <laughs> but if when if you bring if you bring that up, like Deckard, let, let's say Deckard believes that he is a replicant, right? Mm -hmm. Then his treatment, right? First, his treatment by his superior boss makes a lot of sense. Yes. Because the guy is just sending a replicant off after other replicants. He doesn't care, right? No human collateral damage, right? But then that, that in turn makes it really sinister on him. Why does he not want to do this? Well, because he knows he's killing his own kind. Well, then his revelation to Rachel is doubly as cruel because he has become so callous to his own nature that he's unable to sympathize with her anymore. And the revelation. No, and, and he's not not her. sympathetic. He is on purpose made himself numb. So it's it's not that. Sure. He, yeah, yeah, I agree. Uh, no, because there is sympathy. Agree. He's he's he's. There's room for that. Ignoring the sympathy. He's it's, he's just like sure. <clears throat> it's not even like rip the bandit off. It's like I'm just gonna stab you in the heart because you might as well get it over with now. If that is the case, then would it wouldn't it make what Harrison Ford did not Harrison Ford, but what Decker did, uh, in kind of. Uh, being more aggressive with a romance, mm -hmm. wouldn't that make it almost non-consensual? And that opens up another can of worms. Well, wait, right? wait, 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 wait. What, what makes you? Because okay, so because part of it was he's, in a sense she was interested, but it's also she is whether she's interested or innocent. Not. And whether so it's something not. where for her, when you, I, I, I don't know about you, but like then, when people, especially women have that like sexual desire present it's terrifying mm -hmm. right. it's not a fun thing to feel it's not this like sure. nice calm peaceful thing like no when you actually are experiencing like strong sexual desire you want to run away sure and so it's something where with that and if she had actually fought him more if she if she if, if she had actually said like no like i don't want this then he would have stopped i genuinely believe that i didn't quite I think, think you that want to believe the that. first time i think that he knew she didn't want to say no so he actually i think you want encouraged, to believe that that's possible <laughs> knowing what i know about myself and knowing what i know about there's men a lot and women of room for moment, interpretation here right because if you think about it if he is that callous enough to ignore it then he's also callous enough to manipulate her then to manipulate someone so so in but such he could have a gone and had sex state. with anyone to have sex with her was a very specific thing yeah i agree and so that i don't doesn't, that doesn't make it better Depending on what you believe, about I don't think intentions. he was manipulating her. I think he wanted her to be honest with her and with himself <laughs> because a life, because his his life, honesty wasn't important, not really. He just needed to do his job, and even then, like, he just needed to do his job correctly. Like nobody cared. He was he was just a body, and so it's something. He's a very very good body, but he was still he's just a body, and so to be more than that with her to have that honesty and have that openness from her 
of whether or not she was being honest with herself. But then um, to force that honesty out is. You would say that that's not. I see. Okay, but I'm okay. This is. I'm not. I'm not arguing one way or the other. I'm presenting the other case. That's why I'm thinking right? it's. But for me, okay. So it's something where for me there are times now I do my best to be extremely honest in every situation. That does not always happen, but I do actively work hard to be honest with myself and with other people. And uh, actually, sometimes I don't do my best. But when I do my best, which is often, I am as honest as I can be. And so in this kind of situation, the idea of running away, the idea of ignoring this, like I understand both sides. I would want someone to get me to be honest even when I don't want to be. And so that, like the wanting to run away from that makes sense while also wanting to stay but not having the courage or the confidence to stay and just be honest and say no like I want you to like it's 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 unsettling it's unnerving it's not comfortable and so that kind of blunt honesty it's it's a very very uncomfortable thing and so because especially because of how young she is okay um yeah it's it's this really weird situation for her and he's I could definitely you could definitely argue with the callousness and that he's like too tired to be gentle with her experience. But I wouldn't say that it wasn't consensual. I would simply say that it was fast and it was blunt and almost a forced honesty, but it wasn't forced. And next time on Therapy Sessions oh with Rosemary. Oh, my <laughs> Isn't this a great movie? Look it what it's brought out. It is a good movie. Hey, no, 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 no. <laughs> this is a well-made movie. Okay? So, I don't disagree with that. I so just I'm not don't going to watch the whole thing So I'm not going to argue one way again. or another at this point. Uh, okay. Simply because, you know, it's that that was what I wanted to bring out. The um, fact that when you when you watch this movie. It is thought-provoking. There is, there is so much that's going on, and there's so much depth that you can explore that something as simple as that one little okay. thing. Okay. So, you what end is up... your favorite scene in the movie? Uh, my favorite scene in the movie is probably every time you have like an overview and overcast of a city. Really? Yeah. Nothing to do with people. Um, so just a really good view of the world. Well, I'm okay. So, well, the, the okay, the typical one for in terms of people. <laughs> Um, is when Roy Batty, I was going to say Roy Howard because the actor's last name Honestly, is Howard. Honestly, Howard is easier to say. <laughs> so Howard uh, gives that tears in the rain uh, monologue at yes. the end. That's, no, that's... There, I don't think there's anything that really tops that. Yeah. Um, outside of my top five. Yeah, that's that, that monologue is just... There's so much to it. It's impre- it goes in so many different directions. Yeah, and it's done. It's done. It goes goes in so many different directions. It it's done so succinctly, and yeah. the way that he delivers it is so powerful. Um, just, and then the scene setup of everything as he's saying it. And Harrison Ford looking like a scared, broken man on the right. ground. Because, I mean, he's realizing just how not of a man he is at that moment, right? I feel like that's what made me sad about the running away. Mm-hmm. Because when he ran away from with her. Oh, that's okay. At the end. Okay. Because it almost didn't seem like he was protecting her. It was he was protecting himself and he just wanted well, to bring her with. You gotta remember. And that, that actually kinda threw me off. The the the, the car scene at the end with the No no, no just in the hotel, just to the elevator. Okay. Like there was there was that that very tender moment where he comes in and he's like he's terrified that something has happened to her because the door is open. Right. Um this part is actually where I would, this is why I would say Blade Runner is a good movie and doesn't end in tragedy. The tragedy, if it had happened, would, would have him been him accidentally shooting her. <laughs> that would have been I was actually worried about that both times. I couldn't remember what, how, <laughs> okay. how it ended. And so I was like, wait, nice. I thought they got away, but like, I don't remember. But um, yeah, her being in the bed and him like gently kissing her awake of just like, oh my gosh, thankfully you're here. <laughs> right. This is amazing. You're not dead. And um. Right, because after that meeting with I, for, I always forget this guy's name, but the partner guy. Yeah. Right. You go. You suddenly go. Okay. Oh no, is she, is she dead? Because he yeah. says you're done. Right. And yeah. he wasn't done. 
Yeah. Right. And so. I assumed that it meant, I actually both times assumed that it meant he could take her and go. And then when the door was open, I was like, wait a second. Right. Oh no. Fudge. Okay. Is he going to shoot her? Is this right. a thing? And so anyway, but the point is that like the tenderness of that moment doesn't take away from the fact that he's running away. Mm-hmm. And it's a very cl- it's a toss up between whether or not he was running away to protect himself or running away to protect her. Right. That's the that's and the interpretation. That's the frustrating the part is like because like I want it to be for him to protect her, but mm. it feels more selfish than that, and it mm. it just it hurt a little bit. That I'm like he he's just like this weak man. That's why you should watch the film a third time to see mm. if you can you want to make that up for yourself. Maybe and that again I also is the actually beauty read of this film. The synopsis of the of the book that it's in, that inspired okay. this, mm-hmm. and so something where part of there it is a character named I've never read yeah it, Rick but Deckard a, yeah there's yes a Rick no Deckard and and his, the yeah. idea is that he's married and Rachel seduces him so that way he doesn't kill her, uh-huh. and um, he ends up uh, killing everyone else, and I think Rachel dies. I can't remember if uh, he kills her or not. But uh, Rachel does end up dying. But um, in this in this world, and they kind of mention it with like the snakes and stuff. Is like who can afford a real snake? Mm-hmm. And so his dream is that he wants to have a real live sheep. Right. Um, he owns an electric one, and he and his wife and him take care of it. Right. But he wants a real one. And so with the bounty money, um, he goes and buys himself a real sheep. And then Rachel kills the sheep. And um, he ends up like at the end of the at the end of the book, he finds like a, a toad and he's so excited. He's like he brings it home. He's like, look, it's living. And then it's like it's not. It was actually a robot that was just out in the rain. Right. And the wife like it ends with like the wife buying like these fake insects for the fake toad to eat, mm-hmm. so that way he can feel better about himself. And it was just like this is a very weak man. And I mean, it was interesting because that's how it's interesting how this film reflects that. Yeah, right. and so it helped, it it, le- it has me leaning more towards um, uh, Deckard just being this very weak man, mm-hmm. and the reason why his perspective is important is because he's he's witnessing all these things and it's making him think, but his weakness isn't allowing him to make the right decisions. Mm-hmm. And so. Again, like I said a little bit earlier, this is not a film. This is not an action hero film. No. It is it is very much There aren't any heroes. Yeah. There the closest aren't might any be Rachel. Heroes. Maybe. No. She's the closest and she's still not a hero. <laughs> she might be a protagonist, but she's not a hero. Right? There's no one coming to save anybody. There's no one coming to do well, she all saved the cool him. stuff. Nah, not if you interpret it the way you just did. No no no. The um Oh, shooting you mean, the like, dude. shooting, shooting uh, Leon. Leon. Yeah. Yeah, but that's really tragic. The first action that she does after she finds out that she's a replicant is to kill another replicant. Yeah. That's pretty tragic. That's yeah. not a that's not heroic. <laughs> I, that, well, that's what I'm saying. It's the closest thing to heroism in this but movie. Because Decker doesn't really right? save her either. Right. So it's so it's so everything is done out of this need or desire for survival mm-hmm. and desire well, for um, being valuable to this... another's eyes. This movie right. and this story, as well as several other things written by um, Philip K. Dick? Yeah, Philip K. Dick. Yeah. Um, inspired Stephen King. And I really dislike the way that Stephen King looks at the world because he looks at it as in human beings are extremely selfish cre- creatures with their own personal agendas. And sure. there is no God. And those who believe in God are even worse than that. And sure. it, it's this very dark depressing, sad, demented universe that all of his stories come out of. Sure. Um, and so it makes me a little bit sad to watch things that inspired those kind of people mm-hmm. to write about the the darkness without end. Yeah, so in a, in a way, that that background does occur in Blade Runner. And in a, in a sense, to me, again, coming back to like why I really love this film, uh, there's just so much saturation of this of that idea in this film. The darkness? Yeah. Never ending? But there's... Hopelessness? But there's an <laughs> interesting kind of cross with optimism, in a sense. Where Point out the optimism, because I'm, this is this is, this is is the one movie, you guys, where like I'm the one who's super negative and Isaac mm-hmm. is the one who's super positive. So please share with me where you find optimism in this well, movie. Well, so... I'll, I'll point out one example, and this is a this is a quotation uh, from a I think I'm pretty sure it's a woman. Her, I mean, name is Leia. I'm assuming that's a woman, but you never know these days. KD is a just you know, keep going. Whatever. I mean, KD, Cassie, Casey, whatever. You know, 
their their names for both anyway. So it's, <laughs> I don't know about Leah anymore. Leo. All right. Anyway, Leah, Leah D. Shade uh, from Patheos. Uh, she writes this in a little kind of, I don't know what it's called, but it's like a, it's an article on this website called okay. Patheos. Um, and she says this, then as Deckard dangles from the steel beam of a rooftop after missing his jump across the chasm, Roy appears holding a white dove. You remember that scene? Yes. Okay. He jumps across to Deckard with ease and watches his hunter struggle to hold on. Quite an experience to live in fear, isn't it? That's what it is to be a slave. Then, just as D Deckard's hand slips, Roy reaches out and grabs him with his nail-pierced hand. He lifts Deckard up and swings him onto the roof in a final act of mercy for the man who had just killed his friends and intended to kill him. In that moment, Roy becomes a Christ-like figure, his hand reminiscent of Jesus' own hand nailed to the cross. The crucifixion was a saving act, and Roy's stunning last act, saving Deckard when he did not at all deserve saving, is a powerful scene of grace. And it's a fascinating kind of turn because when you watch this movie over and over again, you understand that Roy Deckard is not a good guy. <laughs> and in fact, in many ways, he, he might be the villain that is portrayed in this, in this film. And what we begin to see is these replicants are really kind of not innocent as in like they've never done anything wrong but they are the most innocent in this in this film right and so what you have i mean we, we talked about it at the beginning is these four replicants they're like children they're very they've been they've been forced to do horrible things uh in the name of what they were created for by human beings and yet they still have this purity about them um, that does not diminish even while they're dying, right? And so when Roy Batty is sitting on that rooftop delivering that tears in the rain monologue, mm -hmm. it becomes so meaningful. Right after he dies, the dove flies away, right? That's, that's, a, that's, that's the immediate, in the final cut, it's the immediate, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, immediate thing afterwards. And so it's like these these unfortunate in a in a not in our metaphysical sense but in the film's metaphysical sense these unfortunate souls right are finally set free right um and what they've accomplished is it might be tears in the rain of this world but in you know perhaps in a more meaningful metaphysical way maybe there is something else for them, right? Mm. And so it's it's a very, it's a really good film <laughs> to, to, to th that despite the darkness, and it's, it's very oppressive, like everything about this movie almost, it, it's like, it would be, it, it, would, it would make you feel like the director's hand if, if you want to view it that way, but it's like the director is trying to show you just how dark and dirty and grimy it is that even at the top of the pyramid, right, there's evil and all this kind of stuff. But then there is this, I don't know if he meant to write it this way, but there's this Christ message that forces itself through to, 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 to the end of this film despite the very uh, dystopian attitude that it has, right? And I, I love like that I feel like he couldn't have not done that on purpose. I don't know. Especially with the nail I've never and, the, talked and the dove, with Ridley Scott. That's true. <laughs> and That's so, true. but it's, so there's there's the, so yeah, this is to me a good film, like a good en the good ending to the film, right? Um, people very pe people who are kind of I guess very wrapped up in the idea of is Deckard a replicant? And I'm not trying to like bring shame on people that, that do that. I, I used to do that, and, and I still do that sometimes with world building, and, because that's a, an important part of world building, right? You want to have these questions for your audience so that they can, you know, either talk on forums or talk to each other or whatever and just yeah. kind of build that, that rapport. And so it's a really, really important part. That's the part that the movie kind of ends on where Deckard picks up that unicorn little war mm -hmm. and go and, and you, you get that final, 
not nail in the coffin, but final question of the coffin, <laughs> I guess, of is he is he a replicant, right? This was supposed to be a question, right? Now it's been made clear this is supposed to be a question of, uh, uh, in this film, right? Um, and so despite that 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 chronological ending, I think the thematic ending of this film is in the tears and the rain dialogue, yes. or not, not uh, the monologue, right? yeah. sorry, right? Um, and because of that, it to me it becomes an a an extremely positive film that I really love, right? And so, yeah. Definitely interesting. And I do... I can appreciate how this film was made. I can oh, yeah. genuinely appreciate how this film was made, yes. how it was written. Um, yeah, to, uh, the reason I recommend this to everybody that I... Or not, I, sh I shouldn't say that. I, the reason I recommend this to most creatives that I know, so the reason I recommended it to you, is because when you watch this film, it's very, very difficult to not be inspired in terms of the filmmaking and the cinematography the the you know the oh man we didn't talk about the soundtrack uh but vangelis is just such a awesome composer i in, actually in this. have that in there is they do a really good job of like especially with the soundtrack it's it's a very eerie jarring thing and yeah. then they have and then there's beautiful moments too so yeah. there's the the soundtrack is really well done yeah you sh um it's, it's done with purpose there there is no synth uh enthusiast or modern composer today that would not name Vangelis as really? uh, um, oh. a, an inspiration. Okay. Because he he basically tore open what synths are capable of. Well, who did 2000? Um, no, 2001 Space Odyssey doesn't really have synth. That's more, that's orchestral. Never mind. So he, he went from, like, we don't have the John Williams orchestra. We don't have the Hans Zimmer beats. We have this kind of, co the colors of the synth world that yeah. he, he shows off. And Okay. Yeah. And so... Yeah, no, but the soundtrack is very, very good. The plot is simple enough that you can actually enjoy the themes. It's not... It is convoluted, but it's convoluted in a way that mostly works um, for the film. And then the cinematography is lovely as well. Yeah. And then, wait, so you can't see the director's hand? Because that's another one of your... No, I, I'm... So, yesterday, when I was watching this film, um, for the however many at time, <laughs> um, but... I was watching this film and I was sitting down taking the notes. I, I, I when I sat down to take the notes, I knew okay, I'm not gonna be able to take notes like really very well. I took notes during the first half. I didn't take notes during the second half. I was just half. like, there's, there's, I know I, I can kind of, I, I, I can kind of see this film in my eyes, and I know like I'm not gonna be able to enjoy this film. I have to stop every five seconds just to write something amazing down, right? Yeah. <laughs> that, that I've seen, right? And so I'm just not, I'm not gonna try <laughs> to, to, to write anything down. This is the shortest notes I've ever written. Um, it's uh, usually I write about six to six to seven pages of notes. This one's three, um, and most of them are like one lined <laughs> instead of like this nice. uh, paragraph or whatever. Um, and so, and it's because I just, again, I, I just love sitting in the world of this film. Um, I can see director's hand in the sense that I know that, you know, like. You know, like when a camera, ca camera, camera pans, <laughs> when a camera yeah. pans down, right? Mm -hmm. That's the that, that's the director trying to show me something. But there's just so much in the thing. I'm I'm so captured by it that yeah. I'm not really like, I'm not seeing necessarily what the definitive thing that the director wants me to see. The I'm funny... seeing the thing that maybe the director wants me to interpret. The funny thing with that was that um, so I actually can see the director's hand with this, mm -hmm. but. The really amusing part was that, so I watched it with a friend, mm -hmm. and there were several scenes where, like, I know where the center of focus is supposed to be. Like, mm -hmm. I know what, what, the, what the director's pointing at, what they're pointing at, what the person moving or whatever's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, my friend couldn't. Mm -hmm. He was just in, he was so absorbed in, in the world and right. in, in the whole picture that was being presented right. that when I was like, oh, okay, yeah, there, uh, I was, uh, the one scene that I said it out loud was with um, Rachel in the crowd with the white fur thing and like you see her moving at one point through the okay. people yeah. but the, it's back far enough mm -hmm. that um it's not you have to know what you're looking for but i'm also the kind of person that like i can recognize people in a crowd and right. a lot of people can't do that well so the idea that that of that and so i the, the argument i would make is that i think you were fooled by thinking you thought like you could see it but really that was the distraction off of the rest 
right? And so, and that's what makes Maybe? that f- this film. And I'm not, I'm not trying to doubt your ability to see the director's hand or anything like that. But that's what to me makes this film so great. It's that every every time that you start rewatching it. You see something. Well, it's different, like an I Spy game, and it's like, oh wait, maybe that's what he was actually pointing towards, right? Because you can't tell, and it's not by obviously there's camera focus and there's you know depth of field and all this kind of stuff that 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 you're mm-hmm. that every director uses with the they camera, right? Have to. You, because that's yeah, right. <laughs> so, Otherwise, you cannot shoot anything. Right. Yeah. But it's but <laughs> I'm gonna have an entire movie where like <laughs> it's just facing this field, but you know that for two hours something really interesting, <laughs> something is happening, <laughs> happening over here. Right. So, so I actually really want that now. <laughs> we're like, oh my god, what if you have the film, subtitles? Right? You just have the subtitles. That's it. Uh, so that you just was, have like this this like really like interesting field film. kind of thing. Yeah. And all you have is the dialogue, and so you're just really confused. Like all of a sudden you're talking about like shoes, and then you switch over to like I didn't want a llama, and it's just like this really like you just get the I subtitles. I recently found and that's it. Uh, Monty Python the Holy Grail again on Netflix. Yes. And I watched it, and it's just that, it's amazing. It's amazing. I like. I am so upset. Because the first time that I watched it, I was 12 and I didn't understand it. And I was really? so, I was, I had to stop it during the, um, uh, help, I'm being oppressed. Like, it was I like the, it when um, I was nine and I understood. No, it. I, I, there were parts I, I didn't understand. I didn't but. find it funny. Sorry. I understood it. I didn't oh, find it funny the first no. time. Um, that hurts. I know. It hurts, hurts me. It hurts me now. <laughs> and, um, and then, it, when, then when I was 16, 15 or 16, I watched it. Um, at a friend's house, we were over there for like her 16th birthday, mm-hmm. and um, the family was like, "We're we're thinking about this movie, this movie, or Monty Python, The Holy Grail." And I was like, "Oh," and they're like, "Why are you, why are you making that noise?" And I'm like, <laughs> "Well, I tried watching it, but I just, I really couldn't get into it." And they're like, "So you? this is the movie we're watching," <laughs> and I fell in love with it, and I I laughed so hard, and like just just even with the opening credits, yep. just the opening credits, <laughs> that moves. was so much. <laughs> A moose once beat my sister. <laughs> Like every time, every time, and then llamas. Yep, <laughs> it's so great. It's yeah. so great. Yeah. So that that film. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's marvelous. Th- that would be what you're talking about, which is just mm-hmm. sometimes it's just the little little little. Yeah, that is actually one of the movies the that I was a little sad didn't make it in my top ten. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, I know it probably could have out won think, Palm Springs, yeah. but like, it's still something <laughs> where uh, with. It should be that It's Palm such Springs. a good movie. It's a good movie. And there's so many good aspects to it. It just, it didn't, I don't love it enough for it to be in my top 10. Mm-hmm. That was literally the first like the time main I thing. watched that movie. Yeah. Um, was. He said nine. I was nine. And it was at my brother's friend's house. And so okay. we were at my brother's friend. Uh, so I was living in Texas at this point. And we, uh, in the area in Austin where we were at, um, it was suburbia, right? And mm-hmm. so we we kind of I don't know I don't remember what happened but my brother I, I followed my brother I don't I don't remember if he knew I was following or if he took me uh, but we went to his friend's house mm-hmm. and I had and we, they were talking and everything like that and I had a like a piano or violin lesson in about an hour and they were like let's watch Monty Python yeah my brother was like no I don't think my 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 little nine year old brother can watch that film. I was like, no, I want to watch it, right? Because you, yeah. you want to follow your, your 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 brother, older brother, around and everything. Yeah. And so he was like, no, I, I feel like he wouldn't get it, and you have to go to like your lesson in like a few, like half an hour and stuff. And I was like, no, I want to watch it. Yeah. And then he was like, and they were like, all right, whatever, fine, we want to watch it, so whatever. Right? Yeah. So let's, they, let's they, do they, it they anyway. started watching it, and as they started watching it, I just fell in love with yeah. the film. And I remember. See, you watched it with people that like love the film. I tried watching it by myself at first, and I had no. But, but I was laughing my yeah, head off, like beautiful, like d- during that time, and I remember being really disappointed because the film is like ninety minutes long, yeah. or something like that, and I had to go, yeah, before uh, the, the bridge scene, before the rabbit scene. Oh, yeah. and the so holy we hand had, grenade. Ra- we had just met Tim, and <laughs> yes. and I had to go, Tim, <laughs> and so, so, and my brother didn't want to leave. So I ran out of the house and got lost in the suburban neighborhood and I had to pray and be like, God, guide me because I have no idea where I'm going. No! Uh, but, but So I eventually oh. uh, found my way back home and then my mom took me to, 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 the, uh, to, to my, to my uh, lesson. And so that was great. 
that was a good memory. That um, sounds like a, a very memorable experience. Yeah, and so, but I remember just after that, I was like, yeah. I want to watch, watch the all rest all of the movie. Monty Python. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. Nah, I'm a, I am a little sad because I, I, yeah, I tried watching when I was 12. Yeah, I tried watching when I was 12, and I tried watching it by myself, and I just, I couldn't. It might also just been the mood that I was in at the time. I was just like, I don't understand. I, I don't know what this means. <laughs> and, um... Oh, that was beautiful. That was like it was it was silly, but it was it was like I was I was I don't know why. Maybe it was just a really sober twelve year old of just like You were cynical. It's this yeah. It was like this is too silly for me. I'm twelve. I'm, like I'm I don't know. Older than this. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't have to laugh at this. I also didn't I'm know it was for adults. I feel like I kind of assumed at the start that it was for kids, and so there was probably like an attitude of like, I'm older than this. I think a lot so of teenagers just go through that phase yeah. of when you when you're growing Mine up. Mine was in middle school and actually right. no part of it was in high school just a little bit but that was more like I was embarrassed to enjoy things. It didn't mean that I didn't. So like in my own privacy I was like that's cool. Well, you like, have I to can eventually enjoy grow out of the Barney yeah. Teletubbies kind of thing, right? Or that's what what in my I generation. I actively <laughs> like okay, one of my one of my of. friends actively just had a birthday party and she wanted to watch Blue's Clues at the birthday party and I was like, "You know what?" Like at first I was a little weirded out and then I was like, "You know what? You enjoy Blue's Clues. Like have fun." They ended up not watching it. They watched Coraline instead. But That's um, a very different film. It's a very different film. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very different film. Uh, um, but yeah, Blue's and so Clues something where <laughs> How does that? Let's go get mail. Connect. You're not my mommy. <laughs> but um yeah, and so something where to be able to enjoy silly things, I think yeah. is a very good quality to have and a lot of adults have given that up and I think that that's sad. Well, actually. I think it's a sign of maturity when you can return to the fairy tales that you enjoyed yeah. when you were young, when you were young and still get a lot of depth out of them. Yes. Yeah, and so that I mean, that was a huge Yeah. uh not segue even, but it was just a tangent. <laughs> it's a huge tangent from Blade a Runner. A tangent with purpose. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, there, there is there are things in this film that when you go back to watch a second, third, fourth, fifth, whatever time, you you suddenly begin to go, wait, but but I know this happens in you know towards the end. I know that that that's what they were trying to point us towards. So really, is this this thing that I saw in the beginning? Was that really what I was supposed to see? Was that really what what I was supposed hmm. to hear? Right? Um, or am I supposed to be paying attention to something else? Right? Okay. Um, and there's a lot of that here. Um, and so, yeah, I, I there's okay. No okay, end to the so praise I would heap upon this film. That is why Isaac likes it. I like it again. The bit of romance and the kissing and the, and the how thought provoking everything is. It's definitely fascinating. But Isaac, you have seen this movie countless times. Apparently, what does this do to you? How does this affect what you're working on? Well, I think that one's pretty obvious. Uh, being a musician, if you go onto my YouTube page, uh, it's very difficult to not see the influence of Vangelis, Vangelis on on this uh, okay. <laughs> from a soundtrack on here. Um, what about the movie part, the film part, though? So. Oh, are you saying music is not important? How music dare you? Music is important, Rosemary? but you're how... right. That one is more obvious. I kind of forgot about that one. I like. I personally want to know how, how it affects your stories. You? How dare you? Rosemary? But okay, fine. You can go on how about your YouTube you channel because his, his YouTube channel is such... amazing and very cool, and you should absolutely go check it out. I 100% recommend it, especially like if you like like um, uh, lo-fi or the, just like study music. If you want stuff to just like have on that's just really interesting and it doesn't have words to detract you from whatever it is that you're working on, um, this is absolutely something that. I would genuinely tell you go look up. Um, I've shared some of it with some of my friends actually because I'm like, hey, if you want study music, like here's this thing over here. Um, I'm not a super big fan of synth music, and I still like his stuff. So, absolutely worth go checking out, uh, going and checking it out. I just I'm more curious. Again, I'm more of a writer than a musician, so I'm more curious how it affects your writing. Because like, poor I have child doesn't know things. the influence of Vangelis on all of the synth world. <sighs> Us, uh, us musicians must forgive her. You're for right. Her, honestly, her I think that Vangelis' name is really, really cool. <laughs> I honestly don't really know a whole lot about the composer. Well, um, so yeah, that that would be probably the number one influence. I, I would say uh, Vangelis' soundtrack here is I can listen to it day and night and not get tired of it because okay. there's there's a lot of flourishes and just as a as a as kind of a musician slash. Like I like to compose as well, mm -hmm. not for other people necessarily, but just like I just like composing, if that makes sense. And the 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 flourishes that he comes up with, the 
the mix that he does with the with, with the synthes uh, the synthesizers and everything. Um, it's just so beautifully done that I it, in it's like it's kind of like it's there's an ideal synth sound, there's an ideal soundtrack sound, there's an ideal kind of just musical sound. And when I picture when I think of it, uh, Vangelis is very very close to to what that ideal is, um, especially in in terms of synthesis. And so um, every time I'm thinking of what do I, what, what kind of like texture do I want? What kind of colors do I want in my music? Um, it's almost always influenced by this. And it's because he's touched so many other okay. things, right? Um, if you, we, we didn't discuss this, but when you go into, when you watch, a lot of people who don't like this movie necessarily do like Blade Runner 2049. That's um, honestly one of the things that I do want to watch at some point in the future because I've I've been told that is that that oh, yeah. twenty forty nine is the one that's more engaging can, and a little bit easier to get into. I will, I can, a hundred percent guarantee that you will like twenty forty nine better. Well, yeah, Ryan Gosling's in it. Oh well, that too. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I'm not super 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 fond of him, but I, it was just it was um, really fun to say. But twenty forty nine has kind of a much more traditional uh, story structure. Um, it has a much more traditional hero structure uh, to the film. Interesting. And I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not lambasting that film for it. Um, it's just it has that more traditional take on, okay. on this world. Um, but I, I, I rate Blade Runner, the original, higher uh, simply because... It's more thought-provoking. The, yeah, it's, it's, it's to me a lot more thought-provoking. It's deeper. Um, but it's also, as we were talking about today, it's... There's a lot more discussion that's to be had with Blade Runner, the first one, than there is for the second one. Interesting. Um, okay. And be and it's because, at, at least this is my opinion. Obviously. Well, you like instigating conversation, right? Discussion. So the the second one, because it's much more of that traditional hero based journey, mm -hmm. um, that story and it's it's fantastic. Like I, I'm I'm never gonna take I don't want to take away anything from 2049. It's really really good. If Blade Runner this didn't exist, I'm pretty sure 2049 would be on here. Um, okay. And so so 2049 is it, it's just that good um, because it does the traditional hero structure rather than the exploration of a character in a world uh, or or characters and worlds. Um, because of that, it it kind of loses that depth because it has a definitive interpretation rather than the hints of otherwise, right? Um, and I mean, eventually in the future, I'm, I'm sure, you know, we, we'll, we'll talk about it if you ever watch it. Not if, you should watch it. <laughs> so, but uh, in that film, uh, the soundtrack of that film is also absolutely gorgeous. Uh, Blade Runner 2049, just like, uh, Bl just, just like this, you know, uh, yeah. Th it's, what is it called? Predecessor. There you go. Just like its predecessor um, is... The, the, the soundtrack is just amazing uh, for, 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 for this film. Um, or sorry, for, for, for 2049, right? Uh, it's, 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 uh, and the thing is that they were, it's, it's very um, obvious they were, they were, they knew that the sound of Blade Runner was just as important as the actual film. And so when you, when you watch the, when you watch 2049 and you listen to it, they just, Everything in it is a almost like a reimagining mm -hmm. of Van Vangelis, and it's it's not at all deviating from it. Um, it it's mm. and it's okay. Yeah, yeah, it's really really good. So well, it looks like partially because of when it was done, the cinematography is better in twenty forty nine. I disagree. Really? Um, I I like the cinematography of twenty forty nine. I think it's a product of our era. Yeah, and so we might. Well, Change I don't, your mind about it later? We, I don't think it is better. Um, okay. But I do think you will think it's better. Okay. <laughs> um, not because, again, there's no, I'm not trying to, like, there's no inferior. Well, no, but you do understand here. a lot about um, my preferences. Whether or not you would like them, agree with them, think I should have them, you well, do understand I'll, I'll my say preferences. this Blade Runner 2049 is much cleaner. Yeah, much, which I like. Much cleaner. And so because it's so much cleaner. Um, well, it's like, would you say that Lord of the Rings is clean? Not really. Really? Um, I would say The Hobbit is clean. I feel like very The Hobbit is immaculately the perfect, hobbit. which is very frustrating and why it's not the actually 
perfect. Because like the <laughs> right. Lord of the Rings, it well, the Lord of the Rings is very clean, but it's also it does have a little bit of that that real, not quite grunge, but it has it has grit to it that yeah. the Hobbit doesn't quite have. Right. So that grit, you know, I mean, the most obvious is when you enter uh, into like the the nation the nation of Rohan. Um, and you get into Edoras, and you just see the broken, uh, <laughs> that broken, you know, thing. And so, yeah, yeah. So, <coughs> 2049, Blade Runner 2049, yeah. the cinematography is much okay. cleaner, and it's it, it really is a reflection of how we yeah. we think today of what the future is going to look like. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, but uh, again, it's gorgeous. And I think there's a scene, and and if we if you ever watch it, uh, we can talk about it, mm -hmm. but. Um, there's a scene at the end where it's just water, darkness, and light. And it's shot okay. so astoundingly that I'll probably like it. I want to just be there on the set to just swim <laughs> and be on that set. Mm -hmm. I don't care if like I'm not in the shot. I would want to just go there um, and just and, enjoy, and just enjoy that. And so, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, so, so the... I want to say like the sound portion of the soundtrack of Blade Runner is very very inspiring to me and exact almost exactly what I aspire to uh, when I when I write um, and then of course the writing part the, this is the I'm gonna spend like one minute on this because this is not Aww. important no, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, the writing part of this I love how Blade Runner leaves so many things ambiguous yes um, a lot of the things that we do I think. At least the the way that I've been brought up and the stories that I've been I've heard when I was growing up uh, have such close endedness to them that there's a definite moral, there's a definite uh, hero, there's a definite action, there's definite this thing and that. Well, there's a definite end. There's a definite end. Um, and a, a film like this just opens up so many things. Mm -hmm. It has an ending because the story the the story of the character comes to an end at the end of the, this film, but it never really tries to bring all the little pieces back in, right? And so, again, I have to refer to the, the Tears in the Rain monologue. Um, and, it's, and that monologue is just, it's so good. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of quote it here. It says this, I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. Attack ships on fire off the shoulder of mm -hmm. Orion. I've watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the Tonhauser Gate. All those moments will be lost in time like tears in rain, time to die. And that's the end monologue. Of... Well, he actually says time to die several times throughout the movie. Yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. But that, I'm, I'm saying that whole thing is the end monologue of this film, right? We've never heard of attack ships off the shoulder of Orion. We don't know what sea beams are. We don't know what Tannhauser Gate is, right? <laughs> And just to open that up, and and but it's not it's not like it's not unprecedented because we know from the beginning, the, um and the constant reminder in the world of these from these advertisements of going off world, that there is an entire world outside of this really dreary L.A., and yet we're not we're only given hints of it, right? It's never closed. We're, we're never, we never get closure for it, right? Um, but it's done in such a beautiful way that it's more exploratory than frustrating, at least to me, right? And so when, whenever I think of, like, how, how do I write something where I'm not, uh, I don't want to close everything, right? Mm -hmm. And Rosemary, like, I've shown you some of my yeah. short stories, and you've gotten really frustrated with me at, at some of this stuff. Because I show you these and you ask me these questions like, what the heck is this? And I just smile at you. Yeah, and he's like, that's what I wanted. And, that's, and, and I'm, I'm like, like, that's what I want. Well, that's the reaction I want, right? Um, that and then, is good. And his, his writing is intriguing in a way where it is left open. And so the idea is it does make you think. And I... And so I would say Blade Runner is one of the primary... Yeah. Uh, kind of influences there. there there's blade runner there's the tv show lost um there's mm, almost lost. all of the studio ghibli movies <laughs> and so yeah. all these films but blade runner especially just um kind of inform me like hey you don't have to kind of close this 
I mean, mm -hmm. in your head, you have all these little things going on, going, okay, this is going to refer to this, this is going to refer to mm -hmm. this, this is going to refer to this, but you don't necessarily have to kind of, um, you don't have to cl bring closure of the way that you think of it into the audience point of view. The audience really just wants to know how this has to do with what you're talking about right now, right? And so, so I love doing that, right? Mm -hmm. Just going, okay, I'm, I'm going to make this little reference and I'm going to show how it, it is important to this part of the story but it's going to build the world a little bit so that, um, you know, it becomes more of a, for the audience to explore rather than just to go, oh, that's what happened, right? And, and everything like that. Yeah. And so, yeah. Those no, are the I two that, that. That, that, that I think of when Blade Runner uh, comes to mind. And yeah. everything. No, with, with this movie and with your writing, one of the things, one of the reasons why Isaac and I even started wanting to work together um, on, on my side was the idea that, like, he is, he has very strong themes and very good ideas for world building um and i'm really good with characters like why would you fall in love with this character what do you need from this character what's the motivation why what are they going to actually physically do next so like character and actions are things that i'm good at and themes and world building are stuff that he's good at and so the idea of working together where I can bring out the themes in him and he can bring out the care the deeper character development with me and that blending um you was mean the opposite right you can bring out character for what I'm doing and I can bring out themes for what you're doing kind of I did it can work both ways I did actually I did mean it my way but I, as I was saying I'm like it actually would work both ways right. Um, but it's from different angles. Right. So like the, the whole is greater than the sum of the yeah. individual parts. Right. And so that was the idea of like one of the reasons why, one of the main reasons why we wanted to work together. And then there were moments of doubt for each of us. Like Isaac had a moment where he's like, I really hope you're not going to be the next Stephanie Meyer. I really hope. Is Stephanie Meyer? <laughs> Twilight. Oh, okay. <laughs> he was really worried. And honestly, every <laughs> once in a while, I get worried. And then I'm like, no, I would never allow myself to just like leave it like that. Um, maybe at some point I'll be I'll be less of a perfectionist. You know what? I'm actually but... kind of over that thought. I'm I'm always I'm thinking now maybe she will be and she'll be like a famous uh... famous person that writes stories that I just I never want to read I, ever, I, I ever, never, ever ever ever. Yeah, but you know I could be like, hey, I work with that girl. That'd be interesting. <laughs> but um, but yeah. yeah, but yeah. Cool. So we are done with uh, that yeah. part of the film, and now we've come to draw, draw from, from the, the hat. hat. Where we are going to draw from, we actually literally we draw actually from a hat, hat every single way. time, and we're not just doing it's this. It's really for, soft, yeah. and it's a top hat, and it's really cool. Actually, the first hat that I had, I actually like designed, and it had like peacock feathers and flowers, and this really dope thing that none of you guys will ever see. Right. And um, and then some of the pieces that I'd glued on started falling <laughs> off, and I'm like wait, I like this hat. And so I got another hat. So I have like a regular black top hat and then I have like a, yeah. a more steampunky top hat. Oh, you should hat. bring the steampunky one. Well, that's but the yeah. one I have. Oh, that, oh, that right, was okay, that okay. one. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought you meant like one with like no. cogs and stuff. It does have cogs and stuff on it. It's just there's also that. flowers and peacock feathers. I that only are remember the flowers the and feathers. It even has a little clock. I like made a little clock on it. But um, cool. Anyway, so, so we actually do draw from a real hat, guys, yeah. uh, for the cool next hat. film that we are going yeah. to talk and about. And it's Isaac's turn. Oh, yeah, draw right. from the hat. So, so drum roll. <laughs> being a musician, oh, like you would purring. think. <laughs> that's a little bit. I, I'm like, I was just saying, being a musician, you would think that I should just get a real drum and we should do it, but. And the next movie is da, 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 da. Your Name. <gasps> Yay. Your Name is the next movie. Yay. I've actually seen this movie, and so has Rosemary, as you he, can tell. Isaac is actually part of the reason why I watched this. I think it was because of you and one of my other friends. Oh, we're doing this now. Okay, all right. <laughs> That's fine. No, no, like, y'all are the reason why I watched it. And no, so no, no, I, I'm just saying we're, we're, we're saying that we both watched the movie and yeah. we both like the movie. Yeah. So. yeah. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was yeah. I wasn't saying anything. We else. like this movie uh -huh. a lot. It's a good movie. But um yeah. <laughs> so anyway. your name is the next one. Uh, nope. I'm actually looking forward to this. I shouldn't say uh, no, I should say actually. I am actually looking forward to this. <laughs> um I am looking forward to this because this was a movie that I suggested to Rosemary uh, yeah. a long time ago now that I think about it cuz Corona changed the world. It so. changed so much of the world. It's just, it's, it's just. Oh, uh, yeah. So, so we're going to be doing your name next, guys. But before we end, let's go to our dime, dime segment. segment. 
And this time I actually have a quote prepared. I'm guessing you have a quote prepared. Um, you don't. You are shaking your head I at me. I actually wanted to do the um, Time to Die one, the Tears in the Rain. Oh, but I just... Oh, you I said, said it, it, and I'm like, hey, I was going to say it more dramatically with effect. Um, I can still do that after, but I want to know what, what I want to see you try to imitate uh, Howard. No, 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 no. It wouldn't be an imitation. <laughs> oh, so you would just do what? Like, you would try to do Valley Girl? Oh, dear God. No, no. like... Like tears, like in the, in the I've rain. I've seen things you people wouldn't believe. <laughs> Can we please record that and put it on our Instagram? <laughs> that would be amazing. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. I will. I will do my best, and if I don't oh, absolutely man. hate it, we'll see. So, <laughs> oh my so the, goodness. the quote for this week, um, I guess, because it's because yeah. I found it. Um, it is. It does have to do with. Roy Batty's monologue at the end. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's this idea of tears in the rain, right? Tears in the rain is a beautiful illustration of how kind of, how, how like vapor or like something that is just about to disappear, life sometimes is, right? Um, and especially it, it's, it's like tears in the rain where rain, right? Rain is water, it's wet, it's droplets of water. Tears are also wet droplets of water. And the only way you can tell a difference is to taste it, right? The taste of True. your tears is a little bit salty, mm -hmm. a little bit, and harsh. usually a little bit warmer too. A little bit warm. Well, depends on what depends kind of rain. on. True. In this in this scenario, in it was this... probably like acid warm. Oh rain. god, <laughs> right? you're right. So Ugh. so there's so there's there's little difference ex until you taste it and you taste the saltiness and that saltiness of life is very much akin to kind of like the bitterness of life. Right. Okay. Um, and that's the idea of tears in the rain, and it's gone, um, just like rain, just like tears. It's gone in a moment. But still beautiful right. and meaningful yeah. at the same time. And so the the quote that I have is from Vision in Age of Ultron, when he's a character in the movie Age of Ultron. Um, she's Marvel laughing Cinematic at me. Universe. I was not laughing. I was smiling she in appreciation. Was, she was laughing mock mockingly at me. Well, no. Well, it's also I like love this quote. Um, people just finished the season finale thing of WandaVision a while ago. And so. Oh, okay. I haven't watched that. Yeah, I haven't watched it either. But um, I have heard things. And so Vision is in there. So even though oh, he's great. like, so, he did, he's not right. quite gone. So Vision in Age of Ultron, uh, at the end of the film, confronts a very, very almost dead Ultron. Uh, basically almost uh, yeah. basically going to die. Um, and Ultron is kind of talking I also love about both how of those so the much. human race. Oh yeah. Oh my James God, Spader. So good. James Spader. James Spader's amazing. Actually it's to me it's to me it's Robert California. So. <laughs> nice. That that works too, I guess. Um, but no, it's James Spader uh, is is Ultron and and Ultron is kind of lament not really lamenting but just kind of condemning humanity to die. Yeah. And Vision says this thing. He says a thing isn't beautiful because it lasts. And it's one of the mm -hmm. most memorable quotes, I think, from that franchise. A thing isn't beautiful because it lasts. And like tears in the rain, human life might be, you know, might be brief in a sense, but a thing isn't beautiful because it lasts. Well, and uh, I think it's Elder Tyrell or Elton Tyrell or Eldridge Tyrell. I don't remember what E word, but like t the owner of the Tyrell Corporation, oh, the genius. Okay. <laughs> 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 now Isaac is laughing at me. Um, I had no idea what you were referring to. But when to. he was taught, when, um, uh, when Howard goes up to him and he's like, hey, I want life. And he's like, dude, like you have life. You have the most brilliant life. Like you burn twice as bright, which the means you're gonna die a little faster mm -hmm. and and it was just this really interesting i love those kind of like one of my favorite book series uh one of the main characters william herondale um he the him and his best friend have this life to them and but especially will has this this life to him that um everyone talks about him burning brightly him burning burning to the quick like the idea of like he's going to die out because he mm -hmm. to burn that brightly it, it, it's beautiful it's glorious and it ends and that's why it's so beautiful um yeah yeah so i think that Aww. is a great quote yeah. from roy batty and a great quote from vision yeah. <laughs> from age of ultron 
And with that, we are done yeah. for today. Hope you guys enjoyed this Woo-hoo. episode. Uh, if you liked it, uh, please click like and subscribe to our podcast, whether you're yeah, on yeah. YouTube or anything else, Spotify, <laughs> anything else. And if you want to talk with us, uh, please, you can chat with us on our Instagram page. What is our Instagram page? Bread and Thorn Studios. Yep. And so and that's it's the same thing on our YouTube. Yep. I think that's all we have right now, right? Yep. And so yeah, you can you guys can follow us and talk to us from there. And we will see you guys next time Woo-hoo. with your name. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye. on fire off the shoulder of Orion. I watched sea beams glitter in the dark near the ten hours of gate. All those moments will be lost in time. Like tears. Time.